A very happy new year 2023 from Rao's IA Study Circle and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Today we have taken the New Delhi edition of Hindu newspaper dated 2nd January 2023. These are the list of the news for today's discussion and the timestamp has been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from UPSC Prelims and Mains Perspective. Let us start our discussion with this lead article appearing on page number 6. And the title of this article highlights India's Dilemmas in an Asian Century. So this article starts by saying that if 2022 was a momentous year for India and for the rest of the world, 2023 is likely to further sharpen the geopolitical fault lines set in motion by the previous year. Now as we all know that in the previous year, the world was impacted not only because of COVID, but also or mainly because of Russia-Ukraine war. And because of the Russia-Ukraine war, the Western world, including the NATO allies, had imposed various sanctions on Russia. Now, this also impacts India because India maintains a healthy relationship with Russia. And it is in this regard, this article highlights about India's dilemma with respect to an emergent Asian century. Now, when we talk about an emergent Asian century, obviously, we cannot forget about China. But when we are talking about China, China is not alone with respect to its sphere of influence. So this article highlights that how far can India avoid itself from the sphere of influence of China. And when we are talking about an emergent Asian century, then along with China, it also has its key partners such as Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and also Iran. So how will India accommodate itself with respect to an emergent Asian century in the upcoming year? Now when we are talking about an emergent Asian century, then there are three main players or three primary players in the Asian century or in Asia. These are obviously China, Russia and India along with Japan. So this article highlights that after United States moved out from Asia, particularly from Afghanistan, Russia and China are slowly trying to increase their sphere of influence in Asia. And even though India prefers a multipolar world, coming together of Russia, China along with Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Iran will not be that comfortable for India. So it is in this backdrop this article suggests that possibility of a multipolar world including multipolar Asia will not be that conducive for India. So the question becomes that what kind of multipolar world India aspires for or India looks forward to. So in either case that is a situation of a multipolar Asia where different countries assert themselves on global stage or in case of unipolarity where China asserts its dominance in both these situations or in both these scenarios, it will not only make it difficult for India to adjust in these situations globally, but it will also make Asia more unstable in the current world order where power of United States is on a decline and that of China is on a rise. So both situations does not favor well for India. First, unipolarity of China or China asserting its dominance throughout Asia and outwards and also that of a multipolar Asia where China, Russia, India, Japan and other countries also asserts their global dominance. Now another thing which can make Asia more unstable particularly in a situation of a multipolar Asia is that there would be various kinds of agreements between different countries. Now these agreements could be you know either secret agreements, informal agreements or agreements among competing coalitions or agreements among competing countries. So overall, a multipolar world order for Asia will make it more unstable. And this is what India does not want or India does not aspire for this kind of a multipolarity or multipolar Asia. So the question again comes as to what kind of multipolarity does India aspires for, not only with respect to Asia, but overall global world order. Now to understand multipolarity from Indian perspective, let's go through the words of former Indian Foreign Secretary H.V. Shringla. He said in 2021 that India values a multipolar international order underpinned by international law, premised upon respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, 
resolution of international disputes through peaceful negotiations and free and open access for all to the global commons. Now this article suggests that if anything a multipolar world led by Asian powers for the most part is likely to be the opposite of what Mr. Shringla had outlined earlier. Now based on this understanding of multipolarity from Indian perspective, there are few aspects which needs to be understood particularly from Asian perspective. Now let us understand the dilemma for India. Now talking in terms of Asian perspective, India believes in a multipolar world order as against a unipolar world which is either dominated by China or dominated by Asia. So one thing which can surely say is that India does not want a unipolar world because then it will become very difficult for India especially to engage with China. Now the question comes as to what kind of multipolar world does India seeks to. So India seeks a kind of multipolar world which is based on rule of law and peaceful coexistence. Now if we see this situation with respect to China, we have border issues along the LAC with China and on either fronts that is rule of law and peaceful coexistence, it becomes very difficult for India to maintain a decent relationship with China. And if the global world order turns out to be on a unipolar front, which is dominated by China, then it's a possibility that both India and Russia can come together. So this becomes another possibility. So the first possibility is obviously a multipolar world, which is dominated by China. But India wants this multipolar world order or multipolar Asia to be based on rule of law and peaceful coexistence. Now, other than the aspect of multipolar Asia and a unipolar Asia, this article also highlights about another prospect of G2, which is United States of America and China coming together. Now, they can come together on two aspects, either to compete or to adjust. And this article suggests that especially post-Ukraine war, the possibility of United States adjusting with China is more likely. On either case, even if US competes with China or adjusts with China, it is not a good situation for India. And in either case, impact will be on India as India does not share a very healthy relationship with China, especially after the border issues along LAC. Now coming to the last aspect of this discussion is with respect to sharpening of opposition, especially the Asian players, against global financial order. Now the present global financial order is basically based on dollar-based trade or euro-based trade. And India as of now is more comfortable with either dollar based trade or euro based trade. And India would not be that much comfortable in trading agreements centered around Yuan of China. So it is in this regard this article suggests that what if the competing players in Asia, namely Russia, China, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Iran, does not favor a western global financial order based on dollar based trade or euro based trade but rather start trading in some other currency such as yuan. So on this aspect of weaponization of globalization and trade, this article suggests that there can be a challenge to dollar or euro based trade and western payment system such as SWIFT. Now SWIFT stands for Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. It is a Belgian cooperative society which provides services relating to execution of financial transactions and payments between different banks across the world. Now SWIFT assigns each member institution a unique ID code which is called a BIC number which identifies not only the name of the bank but also that of the country, city and that of the branch. Now post Ukraine Russia war, number of sanctions were imposed on Russia and this made transactions between India and Russia difficult. And Russia is trying to evade these sanctions with the help of its Asian partners including India, Iran and China. So here it highlights that it is important for India to have an alternative payment mechanism in place with Russia as United States, EU and the UK have blocked at least 7 Russian banks from accessing the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication that is SWIFT. And in order to evade the Western sanction, India and Russia have come up with Russia Ruble Mechanism, which is an alternative trade mechanism to settle trade in rupees. So it is on this note it highlights that it is important for India to have an alternative payment mechanism in place with Russia 
as US, EU and the UK have blocked at least seven Russian banks from accessing the SWIFT mechanism. And these sanctions on Russia by the Western world including UK, EU and the US has already impacted India-Russian trade and it has also been impacted because of the CATSA law of US. Now CATSA stands for Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act and it entails financial and economic penalties for any nations that transacts with Russia on arms. And CATSA law has been basically aimed at transactions with Iran, North Korea and Russia. So given these sanctions by the Western world, Russia will attempt at evading these sanctions and the Asian partners including India, Iran and China will provide alternative mechanism through which these Asian partners can trade among themselves. So these are the important highlights of this article particularly with respect to India's dilemma in the Asian century. And this topic becomes important particularly from the perspective of GS paper 2 under international relations, under India and its neighborhood relations and also effects of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interest. So this article effectively gives you an insight about emergence of an Asia-centric century, the aspect of multipolar Asia and competing interest of China, Russia, India, Japan in the ever-changing world order. And it also highlights about prospect of G2 that is United States and China coming together and in case US adjust with China especially post Ukraine Russia war then it will not be a very comfortable situation for India. Now let's take up the next news appearing on editorial section on page number 6. Now this news highlights about remote voting for domestic migrants which has been recently announced by the election commission and in this regard this article says that higher turnout is worth striving for basically to include domestic migrants who are not able to vote in any direct elections according to election commission but not without sufficient safeguards so effectively this editorial mentions about two important aspects one is obviously to include as many as voters during the electoral process because it signifies the trust in the electoral system and any democracy is based on regular election which is conducted by an impartial institution in the case of India the election commission of India as it is a constitutionally mandated body so here the editorial says that election commission of India has now proposed a mechanism to facilitate remote voting for domestic migrants and for this purpose remote electronic voting machine prototype shall be used for up to 72 constituencies simultaneously from a single remote polling booth. So this is what the election commission aspires to as through the remote electronic voting machine. It aims to politically empower the migrants who are not able to vote because they are not present in their home constituency on the polling day. So this extract from PIB highlights that ECI that is election commission of India ready to pilot remote voting for domestic migrants as migrant voter need not travel back to home in their state for the purpose of voting. And this pilot remote voting will take place on 16th January 2023. This news further says that ECI develops prototype multi-constituency remote electronic voting machine that is RVM and has also invited political parties for demonstration of the prototype RVM. So this prototype RVM can handle multiple constituencies from a single remote polling booth. So in this news analysis, we need to understand the functioning of this remote electronic voting machine. The reason as to why election commission has introduced the concept of remote voting for domestic migrants and overall the importance of conducting elections for any democratic country. So it highlights that any country practicing democratic norms, conduct of regular election can be said to be the most visible symbol of democratic process. And in India, Article 324 of the Indian Constitution empowers the Election Commission with superintendence, direction and control for the preparation of electoral rules along with conduct of elections to Parliament, state legislatures and for the office of President and Vice President. Now even the Supreme Court has held that democracy is one of the inalienable basic features of the Constitution of India and forms part of its basic structure. So conducting impartial election by the election commission is a symbol of democratic strength of India and it is here where the role of election commissions becomes very significant to conduct a free, fair and transparent election in India 
as it enhances electoral trust among people which further improves the quality of democracy in india through greater voter participation so greater voter participation obviously means or reflects greater trust in the electoral system as elections are generally held every 5 years for respective state legislatures and also for parliament so keeping this aspect in mind of greater voter participation as it also enhances electoral trust among people election commission of india was very much aware about the fact that despite various steps taken by the election commission one out of every voters still in the present circumstances or in the present technological age were not able to participate in any direct elections in india as they had migrated to other states either for the purpose of work because of marriage or because of education so even the supreme court in the case of dr shamsir vp versus union of india on the issue of alleged denial of voting opportunities for domestic migrants the supreme court had directed the election commission to explore options for remote voting for domestic migrants now if you look at the voter turnout during 2014 and 2019 it has more or less stagnated at around 66 to 67% so effectively it also means that one out of three voters are not able to participate in any direct election particularly for general election for parliament and also for state legislatures so overall we can say that inability to vote due to internal migration is one of the prominent reasons to be addressed by the election commission to improve voter turnout and ensure participative elections and approximately 85% of the internal migration is within the states itself Now regarding the reasons for migration the election commission highlights that although there is no central database available for migration within the country the analysis of the available data in public domain points to the aspects of work marriage education related migration as important components of domestic migration so these are the reasons as to why people go out from their respective place and because of this they are not able to vote in their home constituency further it also mentions about out migration that is leaving one's place and settle in another and this is predominant among the rural population in overall domestic migration and because of stagnation of voter turnout despite several efforts by the election commission it has now decided to introduce the concept of remote electronic voting machine or voting through the remote electronic voting machine So RVM or remote electronic voting machine prototype can be used for 72 constituency simultaneously from a single remote polling booth. So suppose Mr ABC stays in Delhi for the purpose of work and his home constituency is back in Karnataka. So the election commission will facilitate an RVM in Delhi so that Mr ABC can vote in his home constituency in Karnataka. So regarding the RVM it is almost like an existing EVM it is a stand alone non network system that is it is not connected to any internet and having same security features as that of existing electronic voting machine Now if you look at the components of RVM it includes remote control unit or RCU remote ballot unit or RBU remote voter verified paper audit trial or RVVPAT constituency card reader or ccr public display control unit or pdcu and remote symbol loading unit so these are the various components of rvm or remote electronic voting machine now coming to the proposed method of voting using rvm remote voter will have to pre register for remote voting facility by applying either online or offline within a pre notified time before election with his home constituency voters details will be verified at home constituency and voters request for remote voting will be approved after successful verification and for the purpose of voting special multi constituency remote voting polling stations will be set up in the places of their current residence so a multi constituency remote polling station will be constituted for mr abc in delhi Now as of now the election commission has floated this idea and has also called for suggestions from different stakeholders including political parties however the election commission itself has highlighted some of the administrative challenges some of the legal challenges and also some of the technological challenges now one of the major challenge is the definition of the term domestic migrant and also the qualification or criteria to be declared as domestic migrant 
So going through the legal challenges, obviously, the electoral laws, basically the representation of People Act 1950 and 1951, needs to be amended, including amendment of conduct of election rules and also registration of electors rules of 1960. Now, as I've stated, that definition of migrant voter or defining migrant voter will prove to be another set of challenge, along with the issue of registration for the domestic migrant. Now, another set of challenge would be defining remote voting. Now, talking about administrative challenges, proper definition or criteria needs to be set up for remote voter self-declaration. Further, it mentions about providing controlled environment or ensuring secrecy of voting at remote locations, particularly for multi-constituency RVM, provisions of polling agents at remote voting booths and ensuring identification of voters to avoid impersonation. Another set of challenge would be setting up of multi-constituency booths having these RVMs, appointment of polling personnel for remote polling stations and also their supervision, and also implementation of model code of conduct in remote location, that is, other states. Because it's possible that these other states are not having election where the person concerned has enrolled himself for remote voting. Now talking about technological challenges, it mentions about method of remote voting, familiarity of voters with the methods or multi-constituency remote EVM or any other technology if the election commission intends to use them, and counting of votes cast at remote booths and transmit to returning officer located in other state. So these are some of the technological challenges which the election commission might face with respect to remote voting for domestic migrants. So this particular news on remote voting for domestic migrants in order to increase voter turnout is a very important news and this topic gets covered under GS paper too, particularly with respect to polity and governance under the section of important functions of constitutional bodies, namely the election commission. Now let's take up this news appearing on page number one. And this news mentions about exchange of prisoners between India and Pakistan and also exchange of list of nuclear installations between India and Pakistan. So this news highlights that India asked Pakistan to free prisoners and says that it is ready to solve humanitarian matters. India's side sought immediate consular access to 30 fishermen and 22 civilian prisoners in Pakistan. Now this topic mainly becomes important from your prelims perspective as you need to know about the concept of consular access. So this news highlight that India's Ministry of External Affairs has stated that India is committed to addressing all humanitarian matters including pertaining to prisoners. That is Indian prisoners who are in Pakistan presently. And both India and Pakistan also exchanged a list of nuclear installation in each other's countries through their representatives in their capital that is in New Delhi and in Islamabad. So it says that the exchange of list came amid continuing strain in ties between the two countries over the issue of Kashmir as well as cross-border terrorism. Now in this article we need to know about this particular agreement on the prohibition of attack against nuclear installation and facilities which has been signed between India and Pakistan. And based on this agreement which was signed in December 1988 and which came into force on January 27, 1991 both countries have exchanged their list of nuclear installations for 32nd time, that is this year. So it says that India and Pakistan exchanged list of nuclear installations through their representatives in each other's capital for 32nd time. And the list of nuclear installation and facilities in Pakistan was officially handed over to a representative of the Indian High Commission in Islamabad and simultaneously the External Affairs Ministry also handed over India's list of nuclear installations to a representative of Pakistani High Commission in New Delhi. So a list of nuclear installations in Pakistan was handed over to Indian High Commission office in Islamabad and list of nuclear installations in India was handed over to a representative of the Pakistan High Commission in New Delhi. And since 1992, both these South Asian neighbours have exchanged list as part of this particular agreement, that is agreement on the prohibition of attack against nuclear installation and facilities, which was signed in December 1988 and which came into force in January 1991. Now this agreement on prohibition of attack against nuclear installations and facilities reaffirms India and Pakistan's commitment to durable peace and helps in development of friendly and harmonious bilateral relations. 
So it says that each party, that is both India and Pakistan, shall refrain from undertaking, encouraging, or participating in directly or indirectly any action aimed at causing the destruction of damage to any nuclear installation or facility in the other country. Now the term nuclear installation or facility includes nuclear power and research reactors. fuel fabrication uranium enrichment isotope separation and reprocessing facilities as well as any other installations with fresh or irradiated nuclear fuel and materials in any form and establishment storing significant quantities of radioactive materials and both india and pakistan shall inform the other on 1st of january each calendar year of the latitude and longitude of its nuclear installation basically the coordinates and facilities and whenever there is any change in such nuclear installations so these are some of the important details with respect to this agreement on prohibition of attack against nuclear installations and facilities now both india and pakistan also agreed to exchange their prisoners and in this regard indian government has called for early release and repatriation of civilian prisoners missing indian defense personnel and fishermen along with their boats from pakistan's custody So basically, those Indian citizens who are there in Pakistan's jail, India has also asked to fast track the release and repatriation of six thirty-one Indian fishermen and two Indian civilian prisoners who have completed their sentence and whose nationality has been confirmed and conveyed to Pakistan. So, as per this exchange agreement, the Pakistani prisoners who are languishing in Indian jails are sent to Pakistan. and those indian prisoners who are languished in pakistani jails are sent back to their home country in india and in this regard new delhi has shared list of 339 pakistani civilian prisoners and 95 pakistani fishermen who are in india's custody and pakistan has also been asked to confirm nationality status of 71 pakistani prisoners including fishermen whose repatriation is pending as islamabad has yet not confirmed their citizenship status so it's not yet confirmed whether these fishermen are actually pakistani or not and this exchange of prisoners between india and pakistan takes place as per the 2008 agreement on consular access and it takes place every year on 1st january and 1st july as per this particular agreement now understanding the meaning of consular access it is the ability of foreign nationals to have access to their embassies of their own nation in the nation who is hosting him or her suppose if an indian goes to united states of america and there for some reasons he is put into prison so right of consular access for this particular person would be that this person can call into indian embassy in united states and seek help So for this Indian person who is in the jail of United States of America for him right to consular access would be the ability for him to contact his own embassy that is Indian embassy so it says consular access is the ability of a foreign national to have access to embassies of their own nation in the nation who is hosting him and the appointed officer usually protects the interest of his countrymen while operating in foreign location basically the Indian foreign service officers and the rights and obligations with respect to consular access is governed through the vienna convention on consular relations of 1963 now earlier when kulbhushan jadhav was awarded death penalty in pakistan india repeatedly sought consular access to kulbhushan jadhav under the vienna convention and when pakistan denied consular access with respect to kulbhushan jadhav then india filed a case in international court of justice against pakistan in violation of vienna convention on consular relations consular relations states that foreign nationals who are arrested or detained be given notice without delay of their right to have their embassy or consulate notified of that arrest and if the detained foreign national so request the police must fax the notice to the embassy or consulate which can then check up on the person and the notice must contain simple facts such as person's name place of arrest and if possible something about the reason for arrest or the detention of that person in a different country so with respect to consular access please remember vienna convention on consular relations of 1963 and india had also repeatedly sought consular access to kulbushan jadhav 
who was in the presence of Pakistan under the rules of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations of 1963. Thus, this article becomes important mainly from your prelims perspective with respect to current events of international importance, and also under means under GS Paper Two with respect to bilateral relations between India and Pakistan. Now, let's take up the next article for discussion, which appears on page number seven and also in the text and context section on page number eight. And this discussion is with respect to bad loans or NPAs, that is, non-performing assets. Now this news highlights that bad loans share at a decade low in Indian banks. So basically, the percentage of bad loans has decreased. Whereas this news says that has India tightened over the problems of bad loans. So what is the status of non-performing assets? How does RBI go about describing bad loans? And has the government strategy in RBI norms helped? So RBI has released its 26th issue of Financial Stability Report in December 2022. whereby it has reflected that gross non performing assets ratio of scheduled commercial banks that is the ratio of npas fell to 7 year low of 5% and net non performing assets have dropped to 10 year low of 1.3% in september 2022 so here we need to understand these terms so as to better understand the meaning of this particular highlights as provided in the rbi circular Now this report of RBI reflects collective assessment of the subcommittee of financial stability and development council on the risk to financial stability and resilience of the financial system. So this RBI report mentions that global economy is facing formidable headwinds with recessionary risk looming large. So risk of recession is looming large and interplay of multiple shocks has resulted in tightened financial conditions and heightened volatility in financial market. based on this indian economy is confronting strong global headwinds yet india's sound macroeconomic fundamentals and healthy financial non financial sector balance sheets are providing strength and resilience and engendering financial system stability and here the highlight is also on declining npas now to understand npa and further highlights of rbi report first of all let us go through these important terms Now the first term mentioned here is provisioning. Now provisioning is certain amount which a bank keeps aside so that it can tackle non-performing asset. Now an asset becomes non-performing when it stops generating income for the bank. An NPA is an asset that is not returning any income to the bank either in the form of principal or interest during the last 90 reporting days which is then classified as NPA. So if for the last 3 months EMIs are not paid or interest is not paid then such loans can be declared as NPA. Now bank generally faces these problems of NPA and banks generally keep aside a set of sum to tackle these bad NPA when they stop yielding any interest. So provisioning is basically a mechanism to deal with bad assets that is such asset which has stopped paying interest. and under provisioning banks have to set aside some funds to a prescribed percentage of their bad assets now based on this another term is provisioning coverage ratio so it says that percentage of bad asset that has to be provided for is called provisioning coverage ratio and the provisioning coverage ratio is the percentage of bad assets that the bank has to provide for from their own funds most probably from their own profit So banks basically keep aside certain fund mostly from their profit now this reduces the ability of the bank to lend loans or lend fresh loans so it says that npas generally reduces the bank's ability to lend fresh loans now associated with the term npa there are two more terms gnpa and nnpa that is gross non performing asset and net non performing asset now gross non performing asset is an absolute amount or the total amount which reflects the total value of non performing assets suppose npas for a bank is rupees 8000 crores right so its gnpa would be exactly the total amount of its bad asset or its npa that is 8000 crores then we subtract the amount for provisioning or the amount which is kept aside for provisioning Suppose the bank has kept aside rupees one thousand crore for provisioning. Then the net non-performing asset for this particular purpose 
would be 7,000 crores. So it says that NNPA subtracts the provisions made by the bank from the gross NPA. Hence, the net NPA gives you the exact value of non-performing assets after the bank has made specific provisionings for such bad loan. So now let's go through this report again of RBI. It says that gross non-performing asset ratio of scheduled commercial banks fell to a 7-year low of 5% and net non-performing assets have dropped to a 10-year low of 1.3% in September 2022. Now the report further says that buoyant demand for bank credit, that is more demand for bank credit and early signs of a revival in investment cycle are benefiting from improved asset quality, return to profitability and strong capital and liquidity buffers of scheduled commercial banks. Now, asset quality is one of the most critical areas in determining the overall condition of the bank and the main factor or the primary factor affecting overall asset quality is quality of the loan portfolio and credit administration program. Basically, the ability of the bank to provide loan and the percentage of the loan which has turned bad or which has turned into an NPA. Now, the report of RBI further mentions about CRAR. Here it says that macro stress test for credit risk reveals that scheduled commercial banks would be able to comply with the minimum capital requirements under severe stress scenarios. And here it also highlights about capital to risk weighted asset ratio or CRAR. Now in order to understand the term CRAR, first of all let us understand about different tiers of capitals. So banks generally maintain capital such as tier 1 capital, tier 2 capital and tier 3 capital. So it says that tier 1 capital is the primary funding source of the bank. It consists of shareholders equity and retained earnings. So this is the primary funding source for the bank. Whereas tier 2 capital includes revaluation reserves, hybrid capital instruments and subordinated term debts general loan loss reserves and undisclosed reserves. So tier 2 capital contains certain reserves and it is generally considered less reliable than tier 1 capital because it is more difficult to accurately calculate and it is more difficult to liquidate. So tier 2 capital is more difficult to calculate and also more difficult to liquidate. Whereas tier 3 capital is the capital which banks hold to support market risk in their trading activities. So tier 3 capital is basically held by banks to support market risk in their trading activities. An unsecured and subordinated debt makes up tier 3 capital and is of lower quality than tier 1 and tier 2 capital. So basically tier 1 capital is of the greatest quality, tier 2 capital is subordinate to tier 1 and tier 3 capital is lower than both tier 1 and tier 2 capital. Now CRAR which is also referred as capital adequacy ratio is a measurement of banks available capital expressed as a percentage of banks risk weighted credit exposures. So we have already seen the different kind of capitals available to a bank. So capital adequacy ratio is a measurement of banks available capital expressed as a percentage of banks risk weighted exposures. Now risk weighted assets or exposure takes into account credit risk, market risk and also operational risk. So it says that capital adequacy ratio also known as capital to risk weighted asset ratio is used to protect depositors and promote the stability and efficiency of financial systems around the world. Now capital adequacy ratio is also linked to determining the adequacy of capital in a bank. So a higher capital adequacy ratio means that a bank has sufficient capital to withstand any financial losses or any financial storm. So it highlights that CAR is critical to ensure that banks have enough cushion to absorb a reasonable amount of losses before they become insolvent. And CAR is also used by regulators to determine capital adequacy for banks and also to run stress tests. Now any bank with high capital adequacy ratio is considered to be above the minimum requirement needed to suggest solvency. So higher capital adequacy ratio is considered good for any financial institutions including bank as it suggests that it has enough capital to withstand any loss. 
Therefore, higher a bank's capital adequacy ratio, the more likely it is to be able to withstand a financial downturn or other unforeseen losses. So higher capital adequacy ratio also signals the ability to tackle bad loans by any bank. Now coming back to the vicious circle of bad loan, rising NPAs of banks reduces the bank's ability to provide loan or provide credit. This further reduces their credit creation ability and also reduces investment in the market. Less investment in the market leads to low employment generation and also low demand. This further leads to economic slowdown. An economic slowdown also impact firms as then their profit decreases and then they are unable to pay back their loans. So this is a vicious circle of bad loan. Now these articles highlight certain reasons for declining NPAs and there are two reasons which have been highlighted here with respect to declining NPAs. The first reason is drop in slippage ratio. Now slippage ratio is the rate at which good loans are turning bad and it is measured by fresh accretion of NPAs during the year divided by total standard assets at the beginning of the year into 100. And the slippage ratio is around 2% in September 2022 for scheduled commercial banks, which is lowest since 2015. Now, low slippage ratio shows how well asset qualities are managed by the bank. Now, another reason for declining NPA is write-off of loans by the banks. Now, writing off loans essentially means it will no longer be counted as an asset. So basically, writing off a loan means removing the loan from the balance sheet. So by writing off loans, a bank can reduce the level of non-performing assets on its books. However, the bad loan does not vanishes and bank writes off a loan after borrower has defaulted on the loan repayment and there is a very low chance of recovery for such loans. And the lender then moves the defaulted loan or NPA out of the asset sites and reports the amount as a loss. However, after writing off such loans, banks are still supposed to continue their efforts to recover the loan using various options and they have to make provisioning as well. So based on this understanding of write-offs, this report suggests that bank voluntarily chose to write off NPAs to maintain healthy balance sheet. That is, they remove the bad loans from their asset sheet. According to the data given by finance ministry, Banks had written off bad loans worth 10,9511 crores in the last five years. And in the first half of financial year 2022-23, the loan writes off as a ratio of gross non-performance assets has increased to 22.6%. So both these factors, that is drop in slippage ratio and increasing write-offs by the bank, has not only reduced the share of bad assets but has also increased the profitability of scheduled commercial banks in the last one year on their balance sheet. So this is the reason of declining NPAs. Now look into this question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2017. The question was, which of the following statements best describe the term scheme for sustainable structuring of stressed assets recently in the news? The options were, it's a procedure for considering ecological cost of developmental schemes formulated by the government. It's a scheme of RBI for reworking the financial structure of big corporate entities facing genuine difficulties. C. It is a disinvestment plan of the government regarding central public sector undertakings. And D. It is an important provision in the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code recently implemented by the government. Here the correct answer was B. That is S4A or Scheme for Sustainable Structuring of Stressed Assets is a scheme of RBI for reworking financial structure of big corporate entities facing genuine difficulties. So both these articles on bad loans mainly becomes important from your prelims perspective as you need to know different terms associated with bad loans such as non-performing asset, net not performing asset, gross performing asset or even CRAR or capital adequacy ratio. So this topic becomes important mainly from the perspective of economy under prelims and gets covered under GS Paper 3 with respect to your mains examination.